Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where our circles are always drawn inside squares and our geometry is always sacred. I am Ryan Peverly, your party host, the holographic projection of a source of light emanating from somewhere beyond this earthly realm. Welcome to the show, my friends. Thank you for letting me penetrate your ear holes with this sonically transmitted discourse. You know it's rattling around in there at 528 hertz, the frequency of love. I suppose it's the de facto end of the summertime, and the lovin' may not be so easy as we head into the next part of our celestial cycle. And with the eclipse aftermath and Mercury retrograde and the new moon, we've all been doing some heavy lifting recently. And this episode is a direct reflection of that, because we're doing some heavy lifting with my man Joe, aka D8 underscore THC. He's the creator and one of the moderators of the Hollow Fractal subreddit over on Reddit. Joe and I are going to dig into the subject matter that inspired the creation of that subreddit, and that is the work of Nassim Harriman and the Resonance Project, which seeks to bridge the gap between science and spirituality and unify physics. We'll be talking the theory of the holographic universe and the differences between that model and the standard model of physics. We'll also hit on fractal geometry, the holographic theory as expressed in a story from Buddhist philosophy, the music of the spheres, how the human brain fits into this theory, the Bible, creation myths from the Dogon and the Egyptians, the Ark of the Covenant, crop circles squaring the circle, and a bit of a teaser for a future episode that tackles Shakespeare's connection to all of this. So let's light this mother up and cast this pod off into a space where the measurement of the internal far exceeds the measurement of the external. Enjoy. All right. Hey, Joe, thanks for being here. Great to meet you, man. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm actually super excited to talk to you. You know, I'm not famous enough for a guy like Nassim Harriman. So this is like the next best thing for me. I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty geeked out, though. So, so that's awesome. So uh, you've been on the Holofractal subreddit for a little bit, I guess. I'm actually I'm fairly new to it. I maybe a year or less, to be honest. Oh, cool. So uh, I don't know how I stumbled across it. I think I may have seen you post something in Conspiracy, and then I clicked through and, you know, you probably linked Holofractal in there and just wound up there. You know, let's just start there, too. So you're the creator of this subreddit called Holofractal, and just in the short amount of time I've been on it, it's become one of my favorites, if not my favorite, subreddit to browse through. So before we get into the weeds here, let's start there. Please do tell the listeners a little bit about the subreddit and how you got interested in these topics that you discuss on there? Sure. Basically, I guess I stumbled onto uh, the work of Nissim Haramin a few years ago. It was after having a a couple, I guess what you you could call like mystical experiences, you know, psychedelics. I I stumbled onto his theory and it seemed like it uh, it made a lot of intuitive sense, although it took me uh, like a couple of months of like investigating it before I was ready to, you know, like really entertain it as like a, a theory of reality. But um, after digging into it, it just kept making more and more sense. And the cool thing about it is that it like it encapsulates so many subjects because of uh, the implications, basically, of living in a in a holographic universe. Uh, it stretches from like you know spirituality to uh, like psi experiments, remote viewing, stuff like that. So it's pretty cool how it's growing because there's a lot of different. Uh, topics that encapsulates like that sacred geometry too is another big one that leads some people there as well yeah absolutely man it really does kind of run the gamut of a a few different topics that that all tie in together here but you mentioned mystical experiences i don't know how personal you want to get but i like to get as personal as i can so was it just psychedelics or was there some other things too uh no it was it was all psychedelics it was mostly dmt um i have done you know mushrooms i've done ayahuasca but it was dmt that really got me like i would call it a total consciousness breakthrough experience you know like experiencing what people call source or all or uh all the different names that people have for it and coming back from those it was really hard to like allow my rational brain to accept what had happened as you know it was hard to fit it in in the current um like mechanical material view of the universe of like a cold dead universe and i guess that's what what's uh segged me into holofractal 
I was going to say, I got into an argument this morning, actually, on Instagram of all places. Uh, somebody oh. had asked me, like, don't I want to believe in a system that's completely rational? And I said, no, <laughs> I, I don't think that the universe is very rational. So I think that's maybe what you were getting at there, right? Yeah. And, and it's not like that. It, it, it's not like hollow fractal or, or the Sims holographic universe theory is like a total a total encapsulation of what goes on in those experiences, but it can at least, you know, start to help explain, like there will always be that unanswered question of what is actually going on here. Why is this here? But I, I feel like it's much closer than, you know, like we just have random particles bouncing together and uh -oh, it became conscious and <laughs> you're experiencing something like this, you know? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the DMT and ayahuasca experiences. I've talked to people that have done DMT. I've not done it myself. I've never talked to anybody who's done ayahuasca, and I have not done that either myself. So how do these two experiences compare? Well, with ayahuasca, I actually didn't go as deep as some other people have. I got some messages there that, uh, like, I was offered a second cup, but I, I had already, like, figured some stuff out that I wanted to do before going all the way. So I have, I haven't been as deep as the other people that I've heard or read about. It was more just like the, I guess mushroom, like a, a fairly decent mushroom troop level visuals. But DMT, smoke DMT on its own, I've done a, a lot. And that's, I've only completely broken through uh, a handful of times to where, you know, you get to that, that source, whatever you want to call it. But, um, that, the, the smoke DMT was definitely the one that, cemented in my head like whoa like there's something what way bigger going on here than than you see in, in dated most people see in day-to-day -day -day life unless you're living a very conscious type of life but the ayahuasca was great i did it uh in the states by um someone who had trained uh in south america for a couple of years and it was it was very cool um i, I actually wouldn't recommend that people do ayahuasca on their own, even though um, I would recommend DMT. It's kind of a it's kind of a weird thing, but I feel like they actually they figured out a lot about how to uh, deal with the medicine being in you for that long and how to guide people through. Yeah, I've heard the same thing too. You you must uh, find a a respected shaman to go on this ayahuasca journey, and you know I'm sort of skeptical about the places here in the states that offer it. I hear what you said about the shaman that you did it with was trained in South America, but I, I still sort of maybe have a bias. Like if you really want to do it properly, you'd have to travel to like Peru or somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I totally know what you mean when you, you're going, you know, you're, you're making like the adventure, you're traveling deep with, to the heart of the jungle here. The, the whole thing is setting you up for a sort of contact with nature. Like I did it in a living room. So of course it's not as <laughs> um, probably profound as doing it in, a hut in the jungle, but it was still, uh, it's still powerful, and I, I could see how it would get you to to that place. But yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree. What sort of entities did you encounter during your DMT trips? Well, um, I actually encountered what I learned from the ayahuasca shaman was Mother Ayahuasca before I had even heard about her. So it was like an you know like an enormous motherly loving entity presence. I guess that was like I was like a I was like a fractal alien forest or something and just this giant giant presence that was just like raining down love i guess so yeah it was pretty cool that i found out later that they have a that's a, that's what like the main spirit of ayahuasca is called and that most people do encounter mother ayahuasca in, in ceremony so that, that was pretty eye-opening uh i haven't gotten to the machine elves that, that terence mckenna talks about but, uh, <laughs> yeah. have you had any entity encounters like that no, no. Like I said, I've I've never done DMT or ayahuasca. I, my my only psychedelic experience is magic mushrooms. So, uh, and I haven't done those for probably ten years or more. I've been sort of brainwashed up until the last couple of years, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I lived the traditional Western lifestyle. You know, grow up, graduate high school, go to college, graduate college. You know, do some shit while you're in college, which is where I did mushrooms. Okay. But my but my experience there was a rather uh, bad one. It was a bad trip. So I it's a whole, yeah. it's a, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a whole story it, that I don't really want to get into right now. But so not that I was turned off to it. It's just my mindset back then was not the most positive. Right. Yeah. It, it, you're in a society that, it, that where, um, those types of experiences don't really jive with what's going on around you. So it could be, it's kind of hard to process what you're, what you're like, what you're going through and, and like the actual society that we live in. They're like almost incompatible. It's, I think that's, 
something that's pretty cool about the ayahuasca ceremonies themselves is that there's this whole um, culture and, and uh, mythos that you basically inherit as you're doing it, being around the shamans and stuff. But uh, I, I, I would highly recommend DMT just because it's it's so fast that there is no grappling with it. There's no like you go from here to there in a matter of a couple seconds. And so you don't really have a chance to get into the bad trips in the same way, although you can experience, you know, what people would call like a, a negative or bad trip. It seems to be a little bit different than that. And I've never really had a negative experience uh, through smoke DMT. It seems a little bit more forgiving. It, it, do, it doesn't really make uh, intuitive sense because it's so powerful. But yeah, that's been my, my experience with that. I've heard similar sentiments from the people that I've chatted with about it. And, you know, I guess my own experience is they haven't really, they didn't turn me off to future psychedelic experiences, but I guess I, you know how I firmly believe that everything happens for a reason. So I've been mm-hmm. sort of on the sidelines waiting to get called in, you know, to the game, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. People talk about that all the time. Yeah. So if people are listening and you want to smoke DMT, hit me up, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm available and, and ready and willing. <laughs> So you have this experience and it turns you on to this, like you said, this fractal, this holographic universe to Nassim's work. When did you create the subreddit? And it's pretty popular now. I think you have like 9,100 subscribers or so, like almost 10,000. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting there. I, I, I think it's about two and a half years old, maybe. I'm just like, what? It, it kind of blew my mind that this stuff wasn't more popular at the time. Uh, there wasn't many, there wasn't too many people talking about it. And I'm like, well, if this theory does turn out to be true, like this, this is going to be the biggest scientific theory or reality theory, you know, ever. And so I just, I thought it would might be, you know, cool, cool to get it on Reddit so we could, with all the cross culture communities that that happen there, the sacred geometry subreddit, the, the occult, and esot- uh, esoteric and conspiracy subreddits, it, it's real easy to like have channels between them where people uh, will be pulled into one and pulled into the other just because of the nature of Reddit. So I guess that's why I decided to start it there. And yeah, it's been growing pretty quickly. The, this past year in particular, we almost doubled in like seven months. I don't I don't really know why, <laughs> but it's been pretty cool. Well, yeah, I mean, that's sort of how these these digital trends go is that it, once something catches fire, man, like even just a small thing, you know, like going from 4,500 to 9,000 people, like that's sort of how culture has shifted, you know, like once something catches on real quick, man, it blows up overnight almost. So Right. That's the beauty of the internet, man. People, yeah. the internet and going viral, you know, more people are will mention it. In the beginning, it was hard to even mention it in like the conspiracy subreddit it would just be downvoted because people i guess either hadn't looked into it or you know th- think just thought it was bullshit off the bat and like it's under it was understandable like uh it, it if you it, it, like he's really not taken too seriously by many people which is one of the one of the other main reasons that um i started the subreddit it's just to get just to get people to look and it's yeah i think it is starting to happen which is pretty cool yeah, and I think, well, I don't think, I know that the reason that Nassim's work, you know, the holographic fractal sort of unified field theory, why that's not taken seriously is because it it attempts to combine science and spirituality, which is, it's, it's a, a big tricky, no-no. yeah, yeah, it, it's a big no-no, it's, it's a tricky uh, sort of, well, I'm going to repeat myself, it's a tricky sort of trick to pull off here, but, mm-hmm. so I do want to get into the weeds of this now. And I think the best place to start may actually be with the more spiritual component, you know, outside of physics with this this Buddhist concept called Indra's net. Could you explain that? Yeah, sure. I, I love this analogy of this little story that was uh, this older Buddhist story from, I think, like 600 AD. Um, it, it is like a, a perfect metaphor for uh, what Miss Sims physics is actually describing at like the, the most basic level. And so... It goes like um, there's there's this god, this like magnificent god named Indra, and he's hung a net, an infinite, a, a net that's like infinitely big, and at each eye of the net is a perfectly polished jewel, and the, the jewels are so perfectly polished that like if if you inspect one of these jewels, you'll see every other jewel reflected in each jewel. You take one of these jewels and you inspect it, and you see the reflection of every other jewel in this net perfectly because they're just perfect reflective perfectly highly polished reflect reflective jewels and there's like this infinite fractal reflection process occurring so 
yeah, that was it's a great uh, metaphor for what Nassim's physics is ultimately saying, which is which is that the universe is holographic, which is the information of the entire thing is basically present at every point. So you could even think of like atoms as being these these jewels where the the information of all atoms is basically reflected in each atom. It's been a great analogy for me to explain it without the technicalities of the physics. Let's get into the the actual physics then, you know. On Reddit, you actually wrote that, <laughs> quote, Nassim has expanded on the work of John Wheeler, Max Planck, uh, Albert Einstein, and Buckminster Fuller to unify physics. What do people mean when they say unify physics or unified theory? What does that mean exactly? Sure. So I'm sure most people have heard, like, we have essentially two different physics theories. We've got like Einstein's uh, relativity. We've got his equations that describe like gravitation. Um, like you, you use his physics to calculate the dynamics of like large bodies, like galaxies and orbits and, and stuff like that. And then you have uh, the physics for the very small, which is like, you know, atoms and electromagnetic fields and stuff like that. And we can't currently, we can't describe how the large work by using the small units like you can't describe how a black hole works by the by the parts that make it up so we have an incompatibility there in, in explaining the two there, there's a couple um important concepts in both of those theories that um the sim has gone off to actually link them together so stop me if, if any of this gets unclear but uh they both have like problems with infinities actually so when uh, Einstein came out with his equation for, or, or his, his space metric basically to describe, I'm sure, like we've all seen like those, those, um, depictions of like curved space in a black hole. People use analogy of like a trampoline and then mass that curves a, curves a, a space, right? And you get gravity from that. Basically, that was only solved when a guy named Carl Schwarzschild found that the only way you can get this equation to work is by having an in, infinite curvature. So the only way that you can uh, like calculate gravity is by postulating that there is what what we came to call like a singularity in in the center. So we still use this. Like say we wanted to calculate the gravitational field of Earth, which is which is one, one of these large things, obviously, even though it's made it small. Uh, we basically would take Earth's mass and smush it into a a size small in the equation, smush it into a size small enough that it would be a black hole. And then we can use that to calculate its gravitational field, because it, it, it doesn't matter like how lar- like how distributed this mass is. If you're orbiting a mass, it could like we could take the sun and smush it to the size of a, a marble or whatever size it would need to be a black hole, and that's how you would calculate the gravitational field. And we still do that, and it's kind of just overlooked as a like a just a, a, a weird you know a weird byproduct. So we we still use this to to calculate uh, gra- gravity basically. So we've got an infinity there. That's basically the, the the large physics, which then goes into like general relativity and special relativity. But I guess we can go as deep as we want. But I guess we'll go over to to quantum mechanics and the infinities there. This is how Nassim actually found the link between the two theories by using this infinity. So then we have quantum theory, which basically we have we have this guy, this physicist named Max Planck, and he was actually trying to find, uh, he's trying to come up with a better light bulb. And we had a problem in physics that was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. So we knew that light, you know, was a wave, and we knew that the smaller the wavelength, you know, we have like different colors of the light spectrum and they'd correlate to different uh, wavelengths and frequencies. But there was a, but there was a problem because when we were trying to calculate the ultra ultraviolet, you would get an infinite amount of energy when when you're trying to calculate the energy of ultraviolet light. So what he ended up doing to fix this was he imposed like a limit on the size of the, of the wavelength. He basically, he quantized it. So he sectioned it into small pieces so he's basically sectioning the electromagnetic field in the packets. And when he did this, he came up with a value, which uh, th- this, this, this solved the problem. And it, it, it was like a, uh, a lower limit on an electromagnetic fluctuation. So he basically uh, was saying he, he thought he was making a, doing a fudge factor. Like he thought there's no way this is actually what's going on because it doesn't seem like energy moves in packets. You know, it seems like energy is continuous and not like discrete but that's actually what uh what he found and 
eventually, you know, we, we learned that it's actually true that energy moves in discrete packets. And like Einstein eventually took his took his solution and, and started started calling these packets photons, you know, so we got packets of light. So um, that ended up actually being the case that energy is actually uh, in discrete packets and his his value became the known as Planck, Planck's constant. And he's basically describing the smallest fluctuation, the smallest electromagnetic fluctuation that the universe does because it's it's cut off there and it's completely like natural units. So it's a length, it's a mass or an energy, and it's got a time. It's basically a wave fluctuation, like a smallest wave fluctuation. And this is like extremely important for Nassim's solution because he bases how he derives mass off of these fundamental units of energy. Uh, Nassim went back to the like the drawing board basically and he's like, how do I derive mass from these fundamental units? Like we know these units have a size, we know they have an energy, so we should be able to you know extract the mass of say a proton from this. And the way he did this was he he started with a spherical Planck oscillator, which he normally when like say you calculate the energy um, in empty space because. So if the, elect- the electromagnetic field spans the entire universe, right, we would just, it's just at a ground state in empty space. And if you take these same packets and you add up, like, how many should be in each, each cubic centimeter of empty space, you get an enormous number. Uh, you get, like, 10 to the 93rd grams per centimeter cubed. So Planck's solution was also telling us that there's an enormous amount of energy in empty space. Uh, this is basically what quantum field theory was saying after after we you know, we run, we ran with the quantum theory of energy. So we, we like ignore this right now. We think there's no way there's all this empty space or there's, there's all this energy in empty space. We don't see it. We see a very, very tiny value in empty space that we call uh, dark energy, the cosmological constant. But so, so they basically ignore this value and this value, this is like huge for why we can't figure out how to link these two theories. We just think this is not a real quantity. It doesn't have any physical meaning. The sim took these packets and tried to de- tried to figure out how he can derive like the mass of a proton from them. So he sphericalized this unit. He turned it into a sphere, and he tried to figure out all right. So how many of these spheres would fit inside of a proton, and uh, how much energy would those spheres have? So he basically just took the proton volume uh, divided by a, a, a Planck sphere volume and multiplied by the Planck mass. And that's where you get the mass of the universe at 10 to the 55th grams. So uh, right off the bat, that's like a little crazy. It's like this this seems to be telling us something, you know, about the nature of energy, about the nature of mass that the proton in, in completely fundamental natural fluctuations of energy has the has the mass of the observable universe inside of it. So uh, he took that and ran with it. His equation basically takes the mass from that, the mass of, of the universe and the mass of all protons, to the mass of a single proton, which is a tiny value. It's like 10 to the negative 24 grams. So it's like, how is this how is this enormous amount of mass energy in each proton? Like, why don't we see it? And how do you get the, the rest mass of a proton? So what he, what he did was he applied what's called the holographic principle, which uh, is basically came out of string theory and showed that you could encode the information of a black hole on the black hole surface. So this is like the, the main tenet of it. And he didn't use it exactly as it is. Because if you hear, oh, we live in a hologram, people will say, yeah, we live, uh, we live in like a 3D project- projection of a 2D plane and stuff like that. Like there's some 2D plane somewhere that contains all of the information. And he uh, he didn't, it's not really that, it's not identical to that, whereas he is still using 3D uh, spheres and not 2D planes, even though it gives the same the same math, basically. So his solution involves basically counting the amount of these Planck spheres that fit on the, the surface of the proton and dividing by the number that fit in the volume. Because if you're saying the surface can encode the volume, you're going to take the uh, number of spheres in the surface and divide it by the number in the volume, and then multiply by the Planck mass, because that's how much each one of these little spheres weighs. And when you do that, you go, you get the mass of a single proton at 10 to the negative 24 grams. It's like one equation to go from the mass of all protons to the mass of a single proton. And uh, this requires a little bit more background to understand, like, why? Why does this work? Why does this make sense? Why 
why does the surface of a pro- like surface and volume of a proton have anything to do with the with the mass? And it gets a, uh, a little bit more involved in there. So I'm sure you've heard of like quantum entanglement. Oh hell yeah! Spooky action at a distance. Exactly, exactly. Spooky action at a distance. So that's so that's what the main. They don't really know how it works right now. They're just like, oh, there's these particles can influence each other uh, instantly. If you if you measure one, you get the other. So there's actually an older theory that is called ER equals EPR, and that that hypothesizes that entanglement is actually caused by wormhole connections uh, in space. If you have entangled particles, that you actually have a literal uh, physical wormhole that's connecting them. Nassim's physics is showing that that is actually the nature of mass in that. The surface of the proton is basically entangled uh, with all the other protons in the universe. It's it's like they are they are wormhole connected, and so the amount that fit on the surface is ten to the forty, which is an enormous number. So most of the the vast majority of this mass energy in the proton is instantly entangled with the rest of the protons. So you can't really look at a proton as like an isolated system. You have to look at it as like part of this network. So the mass information is basically instantly distributed to the rest of the to the rest of the protons. They're all basically sharing, like through entanglement, this information. And I guess that is the basics of what of where the holographic theory comes from. So what we're essentially saying then is the mass on the inside is greater than the mass on the outside. Is that right? Yeah, the mass in the volume is is much greater than the than the than the mass on the surface. So you get 10 to the 60 spheres that fit in the volume, but only 10 to the 40 spheres that fit on the surface. So this acts like a like a, a filter or a choke. You're like boundarizing, you're boundar- boundarizing a ton of energy, and so only a limited amount is able to affect the local environment. Basically, um, hmm. the rest would be is, is basically entangled and weightless it's rendered weightless because it's in this entangled relationship with with 10 to the 40 other protons so i don't have a uh scientific background by any means but i do have a literary background i actually studied creative writing in college and this for some reason reminds me of one of my favorite books uh called house of leaves have you ever heard of it i have not all right so i'm not going to describe the entire thing but one of the, the main tenets of this book is that these people move into a house, the house of leaves, I guess. They move into mm-hmm. this house and they discover while they're living there that the house on the inside measures more than the house on the outside. Okay. And then the house keeps growing. Like there's this hallway that turns from like a regular hallway into a, a long, dark, infinite hallway that just keeps growing and growing and growing. But the house on the outside doesn't get any bigger. Nice. That is that is a very cool analogy. That is that's a really good way to that's a, that's a good analogy because you can imagine the surface of the house as what is actually affecting um, like the environment outside of the house. So the people like looking at the house from the outside can only be affected by this smaller surface. But then yes, you go inside and you you have this enormous volume. That's that's yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Who knew that a uh, a fiction writer would be able to accurately describe quantum physics, man. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So is this the same theory that Michael Talbot put forth back in the early 90s? Yes and no. So uh, Michael Talbot had no, had no physics. He, he, well, he, he was beginning to understand that, like, oh, my God, if the whole universe is entangled, then it could be holographic. But he had no actual math to show, hey, the information of the entire thing is present at every point. But his implications and what he explored were, were is very similar to the implications of the Sims theory. And so in that way, yeah, they are the same talking about the same holographic theory. Um, I think he I think uh, he went into stuff like remote viewing and, and telepathy and psi experiments and all sorts of, of topics that actually start to make sense in a universe where the information is uh, encoded at every point and accessible at every point. So, yeah, definitely. So who was the first person then to put this theory forth? Well, the the holographic principle would be would have, would be the first sort of foray of mainstream physics into this kind of thing, but it still wasn't really grasping what it was saying. It was more that a black hole, the information of a black hole is in, could be encoded on its surface. You get a 3D volume, you can encode the information on the surface, 
but I don't think they were really thinking about like an actual universe that is like holographic, whereas um, the information of the whole is at every point. I don't know if Indra's net was the first, but Indra's net just nails it in my opinion. <laughs> well, not really a scientific uh, foray, but but they definitely they they that's that's what it is. It's it's infinite reflection process or so, or along those lines. You've been sort of talking around some of the major differences between the holofractal model and the standard model of physics, but I want to pick out a couple terms here and then explain what the, the major differences are between them in the two models, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned black holes a couple of times. What is the the difference between the standard model of black holes and the holographic model of black holes? The interesting thing um, about a a black hole in the mainstream is we don't really know what they are or what they uh, look like. We have a couple mathematical properties of them. Like we know that uh, they curve space infinitely, but we don't even really say what's what space curvature is in the mainstream. I guess I'm a little bit biased, but they say, you know, black hole is infinite curvature of space. And you're like, well, what is space? And they're like, we, it's nothing. <laughs> it's a void. You know, we get, we have an infinite curvature of nothing. And, in, in the Sims physics, both gravity and a black hole, um, remember we were talking about a, a completely filled space, spaces are filled with these electromagnetic oscillators of the, the Planck spheres. In the Sims physics, basically, first of all, th- those little spheres themselves are black holes. They're, they're, um, energetic enough to keep themselves together. Uh, there's enough, uh, energy in that region of space. And that doesn't really make sense until, until we, actually say what a black hole is and a black hole is basically it's spinning space so it's these oscillators spinning faster than the speed of light so it's basically like if you had a a a black hole photon you'd have a photon that is uh spinning fast enough that the light can't escape it it's basically it's basically oscillating fast enough that it's it's faster than the escape velocity of light so you, you get a black hole and Nassim's model is basically black holes from the ground up. It, it's these little particles that make space are black holes. A proton is a black hole. And all of them are just basically different agglomerations of these particles spinning fast enough to be a black hole, basically. So, yeah, that's another like r- really important part of Nassim's model, which talks about spin from the cosmological scale to the Planck scale, basically everything being a vortice or like a vortex of space and so you get to the to the very to the very fastest oscillating space which is these these plunk state plunk plunk oscillators so you go up one level to the proton which is made up of these plunk oscillators and you get a a slower like a slower frequency vortex than than the things that make them up and that's that's also the other reason you're reducing its mass from from the Planck mass to the proton mass. It's basically uh, slower spin. So I guess uh, uh, this goes into into what gravity is in the Sims model, which is gravity in the mainstream is just you know curvature of space. You have a, you have like a, a cubic grid, and when you introduce mass, you you curve space. And it's a little bit of circular logic. I, I feel like it's um, gravity is the result of warp space. It, it's it's a little I don't know it's a little bit circular but in the Sims model it's the spin it's this acceleration of space as you as you're getting as you're getting closer and closer to singularity so if you think of the proton like an agglomeration of this of these spinning Planck spheres gravity is just the the flow of space into the proton and get and it gets faster and faster the closer it gets to the surface of the proton and that's that's how he describes gravity it's basically like describing the vortex of a water. Uh, the sim solution basically describes the rotation of the water molecules that make up the vortex where the mainstream version of gravity is like describing the surface uh, of the water which is going down just downwards if that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely so how do we then account for dark energy or dark matter in these two models so dark matter is basically on the lines of what we were just saying basically uh when we when we look at galaxies and we see the amount of matter in them and we try to calculate what what the galactic rotation would look like it doesn't line up it seems like we're missing a ton of extra matter because of of the speed at which it's spinning but in the sims physics uh, again it's just the inclusion of spin uh, so basically when you when you try to calculate the mass 
or when you're using like Einstein's equations to calculate a gravitational field, you're basically attaching an observer to the rotating body, and the, and so you're like attaching your reference frame to to say the galaxy, and then you're trying to calculate how energetic it is. But uh, Nissim's equation includes torque, so you have this extra torque that's involved in in the spin of the galaxy. So basically, dark matter is just the spin that that we don't we just skip right over in the standard model and dark energy is a is a little bit different so dark energy we were talking about the the vacuum of space um and that we only see we only see basically dark energy we do see this energy in the vacuum but it's much less than we thought it would be in the sim solution so we've got this 10 to the 55th gram proton right we've got the proton that weighs as much as the entire universe. So he took this proton and he saw what happened. What would happen if he blew it up to how big our universe is? He basically took this proton and expanded it to the size of our universe. And when you do that, uh, the energy density goes from 10 to the 55th grams at a proton volume to the dark energy value. So it's basically the the energy. So he, he's postulating basically that our universe was birthed basically as a proton. It escaped some other universe's horizon, uh, which was keeping it equilibrium when it was in this other universe. But when, when it popped out, it was no longer in equilibrium. There was no pressure bearing down, so it uh, expanded extremely quickly. Uh, like a sort of this would this would be like a um, an explanation for the Big Bang and for inflation. So it's like you got a, this super high energetic sphere, and all of a sudden you remove uh, the energy that's surrounding it. That's keeping it like in pressure equilibrium. And so you get this uh, super enormous explosion of energy and this energy gets distributed throughout the volume as it's expanding until you get to where we are here and you get the dark energy value. But when, when you spin up a piece of matter, when you spin up a proton, you get the, the energy of the whole, the whole thing, like all of that energy in, in a single point, basically, instead of distributed. So it's kind of two sides of this holographic, coin one is the whole thing and one is it uh, like distributed throughout the whole cosmos basically right god man that's that's just so interesting up front you mentioned the remote viewing and i i did want to talk about that sort of you know paranormal psi phenomena and i'm just wondering just from what you know how does this this model this holographic model account for these sorts of occurrences you know how does it account for things like ghosts or or right. um, these DMT entities yeah. how does this model explain that so by chance did you see the CIA paper that was posted um, on Reddit it was in like holofractals and conspiracy a couple yeah. Of times yeah that, yeah so, I did. yeah so that that blew my mind because uh, it shows that the CIA was also well. We knew they were looking into remote viewing, but I think this paper was a little bit it went a little bit further than what people thought the CIA was doing because they actually came up with uh, like holographic theories. They basically postulated the same sort of thing that the Sim did, and that is the universe is entangled, and so that could explain the 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 lack of distance in remote viewing. Like, how can I see something that is not really physically next to me? And if the universe was completely entangled, well, then there's actually not really any distance between you and any other point. Uh, it's like sort of it's sort of a, an illusion of consciousness because the entire thing is completely entangled. And entanglement means it, it, it's like an instantaneous connection of space time. It's basically like wormholes. So it was it was kind of crazy to see that the CIA had come to that sort of or someone uh, someone that was researching at the CIA come to that similar conclusion without. And this was way before the Sims work. I mean, it wasn't like a mathematical solution. It was more like a, a theory solution. So this this gets into like concepts of like resonance and forms of matter that so you, th- you could think of like atoms as kind of a like a tuning fork that's like zeroed in to a specific piece of information in what we what we call the holographic mass. So the holographic mass being uh, the ten to the fifty fifth grams that's present uh, inside the proton, and so different different forms of different types of atoms are you know resonating with forms that are like them so like hydrogen atoms would be resonating with hydrogen atoms and uh essentially it it means that if you could somehow resonate properly as a conscious if you could resonate uh, as the proper tune if you could resonate with the information that's already present in this holographic mass then technically you would be able to extract the information in it and this gets super convoluted because it's like it's like a, a 
a consciousness thing. It's not like a technical thing. You know, it's it's so it's, it's kind of hard to to nail down like that. But that that's how I could see it working. So are we talking about mental phenomena where I could see something happening you know, on fucking Mars or something, right? Yeah. But are we also talking about physical teleportation? Like my body could travel through this as well? Yeah, definitely. This is going to require, you know, leaps and bounds in our in our technology and the amount of energy you would need. But yeah, it, uh, the universe is wormhole connected already. So it does open up those types of technological avenues and it seems like it would be possible and um some people that work with nisim hypothesize that even stars right even stars and galactic cores are like just larger holographic nodes in in this like interconnected network so you go from like the proton to like a star to like a galactic core and each one of these are like hops you know like hops in in like a like a computer network basically and the larger the uh, black hole, the more connections that it has on it. And so it might be that might be uh, how it work. That might be how wormhole travel would work is is somehow utilizing those those nodes that are already present. Does this theory then also account for the possibility of what we would call other dimensions? It sort of does, although it's not like parallel universes. Really, it's more like that there is this fundamental interconnected network that already spans everything where it's not really space time it's more like time space or something where there's no distance and if there's no distance there's not really any time in this network so this could be like this is how i think of the spiritual plane or what people would call the astral plane it's a it's a physical embodiment of of this of this time space holographic network and so, yeah, I don't know if I would call it another dimension. I would more like a maybe like a hyperdimensional overlay or something like that. Like like maybe like what people think of as five day, sort of sort of like that. But but it's not really a different place, if that makes sense. It's it's right here. Yeah, five D is getting a little uh, maybe new agey for me, but I definitely am picking up what you're putting down. I guess it's not really new age. That's not really fair of me to say that. But yeah, so, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how does this work with the work of someone like Tesla? His work with the ether around Earth as a source of electromagnetic energy is, is sort of related. It also, I don't know if you've been down like the Philadelphia experiment rabbit hole. Have you ever oh, read about that? Yeah, actually, I um, just posted an episode uh, just about that. Oh, no well, way. Well, yeah, it was about that and it was about Montauk as well. Oh, so that, Montauk's like the remote viewing stuff, correct? Yeah, that was one aspect of it. Yeah, uh, they did a lot of psi studies there, uh, mind control, uh, time All travel. Good stuff what we would know now as resonance travel or something similar. Right, right, right. So that's what I was going to say in terms of if this Philadelphia experiment was real and it was based off of Tesla's work, it's 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 possible that they used resonance to <laughs> travel. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, it's impossible to know, but it, they, they might have had no idea what they were doing and just tried to uh, apply this resonant energy or try to try to resonate properly and just who knows what actually happened but yeah it, it that that does line up with with unified physics for sure the reason i bring up tesla is because this theory does seem to jive or work with the concept of cymatics which deals with sound and frequency and vibration and right. Tesla talked about that same thing a lot. That's the reason I brought that up. And that might be a good sort of segue into how does cymatics, how do those things play a role in Nassim's theory here? So I've started to look at the universe as a giant somatic of light. If protons are actually, you know, electromagnetic space spinning and you have entangled systems that start to grow because have you, have you heard of Rupert Sheldrake and his morphic fields? Yeah. 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 So it, it implicates morphic fields. It's basically another word we could use morphic fields for the for the holographic network, and that's basically that forms and systems that are like will resonate with each other. And so I started to look at the universe like a like a somatic of light, and that basically it engenders complexity because if you get a form on one side of the universe that is uh, sustainable, it's it doesn't like decohere to its parts. And it then then you're gonna have an, the universe is gonna have an easier time duplicating that across the universe just because uh, it's gonna be able to resonate with that information. So I, I feel like this is sort of along the lines of like a somatic pattern in that it, it's like the the tone basically. There's it's like an infinite 
tone and there's different harmonics being played and uh you can start to uh, at least i start to think start to sort of think of the universe as a light somatic that's evolving complexity due to this this property of resonance and non-local resonance and uh yeah it seems like somatics like somatic plates is like a low scale very generalized version of this Hmm. okay Let's go back to, you know, I brought up my, my body could possibly travel through this stuff or through this, this morphogenic field, perhaps, and teleportation. You know, old sci-fi concepts seem to be a good starting point for a lot of what we're talking about, to be honest. But I want to talk about the brain, though, how the brain functions in this model, because I've had some other guests on where we've talked about the brain is essentially a receiver and a transmitter, where it's it's constantly picking up signals, it's constantly putting out signals. I think Nassim has talked about this as well. Absolutely, um, yeah. So maybe you could explain to us how the brain functions in this environment. Uh, I'll try. I'll try my best, but this is getting a little bit above uh, my knowledge. So, But recently, Nassim and William Brown and one other person on his team, uh, Dr. Amir Abel Baker, they released a paper, uh, they called it, the Unified Space Memory Network from cosmogenesis to, co- cosmogenesis to Consciousness. And they basically wrote like a theory for explaining how sort of a holographic universe could engender consciousness and awareness. And it's basically like we were talking about with, with like this morphic field where things are getting more and more complex. Basically, the complexity is density of connection. Basically, you can think of awareness as density of connection and you have these systems which are becoming more and more complex over time and thus more more and more aware over time. And I actually think of these little Planck spherical units that make up everything uh, as tiny little consciousness units. And that's because they basically have the the basic properties of feedback and feed forward. I haven't mentioned this, but these little Planck spheres are little toroidal flows. So they're they're going um, like outwards and then, you know, back inwards to the core. And I, I started to think of, and I think the sim too, as, as Planck spheres as being these little, these little units. And the more complex systems that they form, the more density of connections that they form is just higher and higher levels of, of this intrinsic awareness. Uh, the brain obviously being the most complex, complex matter we know of currently in the universe and so th- this gets into like theories of, of Hammerhoff where they hypothesized like a quantum brain where instead of like neurons being uh, a simple logic gate that's like yes, no, or pass or don't pass, uh, instead of consciousness being like a some sort of emergent phenomenon from, from that dead computational system, Hammerhoff uh, proposed that the, the brain could be a sort of quantum machine, which would allow for like an, basically an entangled brain for basically multiple neurons to be in sort of an orchestrated wave where it can make a decision based on like multiply connected neurons basically. And so the Sims physics sort of validates that even more in that since, since matter is entangled, you know, if you, if you have the more, the more complex matter you have, um, I forgot where I was going with that. So the standard model of physics doesn't really account or doesn't have an explanation for consciousness. It's sort of, a, I, th- I think you described it in your Explain Like I'm Five post about some of these concepts that it was, that physics calls this a magical property of the brain. I think what we're talking about is actually has more of a definitive explanation for it. We have to assume then that, that the brain can send and receive these, these signals at, at any time. It's an instantaneous information network, right, that we're sort of tapping into. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, awareness being like the observer of this input and output. Yeah, you can, he, he totally thinks of it as a sort of antenna or a sort of like a, a complex network of space that engenders awareness. Uh, the mainstream theories of physics basically have to get rid of free will because it, it, it becomes like deterministic in that, well, if our computer is just like a logic gate and you have electrical signals that are basically consciousness being an illusion of these electrical signals, then there doesn't seem to be any free will. Where um, in the Sims theory, it, it's more that you definitely you definitely get free will because the individual subunits are actually uh, intrinsic awareness themselves, and they build on each other. So wait, does that mean that it, it discounts the notion of fate? This gets a little bit tricky for me to understand. I've talked to one of the resonance science members about this for a while, it does and it doesn't. It does because this this 
complex uh, evolving universe of light basically and each piece being an individual awareness does does disregard determined like determinism and uh it it allows for free will but the then you get the whole holographic thing and if the whole thing is holographic like like couldn't you see the entire information set and if you had that like couldn't you you know couldn't you either run it back or forth to see what's going on and um he he basically explained it as it, it's simply like it's two perspectives and it's like sort of playing out and that uh, it it doesn't in, invalid like the the holographic part wouldn't really invalidate the playing out of it um i'm a little fuzzy on why but uh it definitely brings up an interesting perspective personally uh, i know that they all are for completely for like uh free will and non-determinism well, I can take a guess why we can't see the full information field. I don't know about you, but it's probably the fucking chemtrails, man. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Chemtrails and fluoride. <laughs> for sure. Let's not go down that yeah, path yeah. right now. But, but anyways, so yeah, getting back to this. This might be a good segue then into uh, the more spiritual components here. Let's talk about the music of the spheres for just a second. This is something that I have never really done a deep dive into this. And I've only done some light reading on it. I think the term sonic geometry plays a role here too. But if you could describe to us what the music of the spheres is and how it plays a role in the holographic nature of things, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, it basically tried to refer to matter as, you know, like harmonies or or like different harmonics. And it does directly tie into this morphic field made up of interconnected spheres that we were talking about as the universe as like you're going to get you're going to get different instantiations that are harmonics and the way these spheres are interconnected is going to be uh, geometric you're going to get uh, at the most basic level you're going to get uh, like a te- tetrahedral geometries so the the we get harmonies and we get resonance out of the same sort of principle here because you you're getting you're getting energies that are moving in specific patterns and you, you're going to be uh, duplicating them. And as they grow, they're going to grow in octaves. This is like if you take a, um, a seed of life, basically, these, which is actually the way these spheres pack. These spheres pack like, uh, like the seed of life does. It's, it's, uh, when Nassim derived his geometry, his tetrahedral geometry, if you draw spheres around it, you basically get a 3D version of the seed of life and the flower of life. And if you grow the seed of life you basically grow in harmonics you, you grow if you do the uh the seven spheres seed of life and you encircle it to make it one sphere then you go to the next octave so basically the way that this energy scales and grows is like a harmonic of like a musical note basically and so that is probably why we see sacred geometry uh like in the planets and you see it in like galaxies and stuff like that and it's Basically, just the way uh, that this, ener- this energy is like perfectly packed, and the way it grows and, and expresses itself, it's just the easiest. The easiest way is following these these sorts of geometries. Yeah, and speaking, I mean, geometry. Obviously, we could talk about Pythagoras for just a second. I believe he was the one that put forth this notion of the music of the spheres or the harmony of the spheres, right? Right. He said that the sun, the moon, and the planets all emit their own unique sound based on their own orbits, right? Their own revolutions. And that the quality of life here on Earth reflects that tone, which obviously we, we can't hear. That also explains astrology on some level, you know, how these how the movements of the planets affect human behavior. It's an interesting correlation there between uh, mathematics and music, which is one of the uh, seven liberal arts, and then sort of occult study and occult philosophy. You know, astrology is obviously huge in, in that community. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting uh, correlation, like I said. Yeah, it definitely is. And we seem to, um, we see, the mainstream seems to really not really look at geometry. You know, that's why you brought up Buckminster Fuller's name earlier. Uh, Bucky Fuller, basically, he went back to the drawing board of uh, like energy dynamics, uh, he, he, he basically knew that gra- the gravitational field was going to be disclosed to be made up of, of, of spheres that were packed in the way that Nassim had found they were packed. And he did this by going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, what, like, what is energy? What, what does energy look like in geometry? Like, what, do you, what, what, what would it mean if you had a tetrahedron that was you know, made up of six spheres? Like, 
uh, basically the fundamentals. He went back to the fundamental the drawing board, and it was pretty cool how he could he basically predicted what gravity was going to be just through that. Yeah, doesn't Fuller also have um, God, what's that theory that he something about? Uh, was it no? It's, it starts with a V. Don't the the wait. Don't don't tell you. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me because I wanted to try to to remember it because I don't think I wrote it down here. Oh, uh, vector yes, equilibrium. That's so it, that's it. Is that, is that what we're talking about, or is, is that something separate? Yeah, no, that that is that's uh, these spheres that are packed. You know, that make up space. Um, this is one configuration of them, and it's syn- it's basically. Uh, e- equal vectors in in all directions. You have twelve spheres that are packed basically as close as you can get them. And if you draw lines from their center points to each other center point, after you pack these spheres as close as you can, you get this vector equilibrium. Nassim does use this in his actually in his papers about deriving the gravitational field. Uh, the, the the vector equilibrium can do something called a jitterbug, which basically is a a geometric collapse. It, it, it can collapse into uh, basically into other shapes like the icosahedron and the and it, it moves through a bunch of different geometries until it returns back at its at its endpoint. And so, if you imagine that these this actually models uh, the dynamics of these packed spheres, and uh, you could start to see how that it's hard, it's hard to see without without seeing it depicted, but it, it sort of uh, traces out the lines of a torus. So now we have some sort of geometry that could actually describe how the gravitational and electromagnetic field work as a torus based on this based on this collapse in geometry. Yeah, and speaking of geometry and, and symbols and patterns and things like that, how do phi and the flower of life play into this? They're very similar to what we've been talking about. So the flower of life is actually a depiction of the structure of space as the, you can think of each one of those circles in the flower of life as a Planck spherical unit because, again, that's the tetrahedral geometry of how they pack. So uh, this is another pretty cool thing that I that I'm just sort of learned about. So you know how we're talking about these Planck spherical units, and we're talking about how mass is a function of surface to volume uh, ratios, basically. Like in the proton, you have x amount of surface, x amount of volume. So the sim has said that. The Planck sphere is the fundamental unit of mass, and it's like the building block of mass because it's got uh, 64 quantizations on its surface, and it's got 64 quantizations in its volume. And that shape is actually a 3D depiction of the actual flower of life that is like in the, on the Assyrian temple in Egypt. You know, it's the actual one that's been blasted on the walls of temples for hundreds of years. The, the 64 over 64, you know, if you, if you divide the surface into the volume, you get one. So you get one times uh, the mass. So you get a fundamental unit of mass. And what's crazy about that is Nassim derived this geometry before he ever arrived on this uh, pixelation, this mass pixelation holographic dynamic. So it was pretty cool how that lined up. Now, phi basically has to do with the harmonics of scaling uh, this geometry, which is basically the way that the vacuum, the way that these spheres change octaves, basically, it's it's like if you you were to scale these tetrahedral sphere configurations, you get a uh, intrinsic phi pattern. The size of the sphere that is above the this like like if you double this sphere sphere's volume and you draw triangles, you have a phi relationship between these triangles. And I know that's it's super hard to it's like see without seeing it because I'm not doing a great job, but uh, it, it's basically the the geometry of the vacuum is scaling by phi ratios. Um, it's also we were just talking about the vector equilibrium as this collapses, which is the geometry of gravity and electromagnetism. It goes through like an icosahedron and a dodecahedron, and those both have intrinsic phi uh, relations inside of them. If you could draw an icosahedron by placing three golden rectangles uh, interlocking, and you, you you connect all the vertices, and you get uh, golden geometries. It's essentially just the fundamental notion of of going back to these spheres again and how they co-join each other, the, dyna- the in, like the dynamics between them. Yeah, the theory really does sort of encapsulate not just all of these high scientific principles, but also some of these hidden esoteric principles as well. And we've been talking about geometry a lot here, and you mentioned Egypt a few minutes ago, and I'd really like to talk about the connection here between this holographic theory and its potential connection with ancient advanced civilizations and mystery schools from, you know, thousands of years ago. So I, I don't really know 
where the best place to start is there's a couple of threads that I pulled out that, that you've submitted to, to Reddit that I think are probably good starting points, but I'm mm-hmm. going to let you sort of choose, you know, like we could go down the, the magical Egypt route. We could go down the, uh, the Dogon creation myth route. Where do you think the best place to start here is? Yeah, and either one of those will work. Uh, I think Egypt is probably a good place to start. I guess Graham Hancock's sort of take on it. I do agree with his views on some sort of uh, global unified civilization that um, most likely had advanced knowledge of physics better than like our current mainstream views of physics. I mean, it's evident in uh, the like the flower of life, for example, that you brought up that has been found all over the world. Uh, we seem to feel like a draw towards it. You know, it's like become this new agey symbol, but it's pretty interesting that we just feel like it has some sort of significance. You know, people are getting tattoos of it and stuff like that. Well, it turns out it is actually what the structure of space looks like, the seed structure of space. So that in its own, like, personally, I can't write that off as coincidence. You know, when you see that blasted on the wall of a temple where you have blocks that are, I don't know how many tens or, or hundreds of tons, you know, it's like, oh, maybe they actually... They, they knew this stuff and they were able to use this 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 uh, knowledge to manipulate enormous blocks of stone and, and put them into place. Hermeticism is also, it's like a more general version, or I, could, I should say holofractal uh, sort of embodies the concepts that are in hermeticism. I wouldn't say which one is um, closer to the truth because they're both, the one's just uh, general, one's like zeroed into the physics. But uh, I'm sure you're into hermeticism a little bit too. Oh, yeah, and that is the topic, the subject that started my journey here to this podcast. Hermeticism was like the first occult study that I've that I've really dug deep into, and it really is the, the principles of it are really sort of reflected in everything that I see now. I don't know if that's because they're there or if I'm just so into it that I'm sort of producing it either way. Yeah, I'm into Hermeticism for sure. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it actually took me a little bit to. I, I just listened to the Kabbalion only a couple months ago. And I was listening to it. It was it was mind blowing how much it, it encapsulated and how much lined up with what I've been seeing in other places. Just to interject there real quick, not to mm-hmm. cut you off, but if you enjoyed the Kabbalion though, I would recommend reading the Corpus Hermeticum if you want to really get deep into it. Definitely want to check that out because the Kabbalion really really resonated with me. So. You'll have to share that with me where I can find it. Absolutely, man, yeah. Remind me when we get off the call. Will do. So yeah, the, what is it, the seven principles? Like, they they totally seem to line up, um, especially, obviously, the as above, so below portion of it is, like, can it be any more as above, so below as holographic, you know? That was pretty cool. Yeah, and, and all, all these religions that seem to have a, a mystical, esoteric, or that described this sort of how many how many of these creation stories have that there was a source and it divided itself and you know each portion contains the whole and it might get you know less and less like source but it still is from that original split off and, and contains source basically yeah all, all of them seem to have this mystical core that that points back to the same teachings that either came from this global unified civilization or many different ones and yeah i don't know you're how you feel about that too but it seems like it, it lines up perfectly for me i think it does too and i'm i'm looking at the egyptian heliopolitan creation mythos yeah yeah so that says that adam a-t-u-m which is, i mm. think uh, is that's sort of telling right yeah yeah uh, yeah it says that he uh i don't know if it's a he but adam dwelt as a as a spirit in sort of what like the primordial chaos you know, like those chaos, chaos waters. waters or something, yeah. yeah. And then suddenly just just sort of burst forth into existence, which is what we were talking about with that proton. Right. And then I mentioned the Dogon myth, which uh, I don't know if you know who Laird Scranton is, but he's written a lot about that. But the Dogon creation myth, I believe, I'm not as familiar with that, but I believe it does sort of describe the, the 64 uh, tetrahedron yeah, that, that uh, we were talking about. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The, the Heliopolitan and the Dogon both point to this 64 tetrahedron seed structure of space um they both say you know there was like uh eight of these they both have different terms for it um but eight of these things and they each had four parts one male female and uh 
yeah, when, when, when you look at it in the light of geometry of this seed structure, it's like, oh, they were just encoding this in something. Probably just for when someone stumbled on it, they would know. Because, like, you, we'd be able to look back and say, oh, they actually knew what they were talking about. Now, it wouldn't really help, like, the layperson living back then to, to read that and say, oh, it came from 64 blocks or 64 tetrahedrons. But it's pretty cool how we can now use that as a a key that we can now read or it's like a, a cipher that we can now read and, and say, wow, like they, they knew something. I've heard Nassim talking about this. How does the Ark of the Covenant tie into this then? Nassim has a theory about the Ark of the Covenant where he, he thinks um, it was a piece of high technology, essentially. He actually believes that it could have been a, a little mini sustained black hole, which I know it sounds crazy off the bat, but if we're talking about basically black holes as being uh, electromagnetic phenomenon, or basically you spin something fast enough, you get a black hole. It, it starts to sound less and less crazy, especially with the stories in the Bible regarding, you know, possible gravitational control with splitting the Dead Sea or knocking down the walls of Jericho, I think it was. And uh, the interesting thing about the Ark is that Moses was given dimensions for how to build it. Not only is it like also uh, electrical capacitor material it's like I- insulation and then gold and insulation or, or something along those lines but the arc uh would slide absolutely perfectly into the what, what we call a sarcophagus in the king's chamber so the, the dimensions given the bible would basically s- like perfectly slide in to the sarcophagus in the king's chamber the great pyramid so it's possible that the the, the story that nasim has come up with their nut story or should i say what what his what he thinks the version of events are is that uh, Moses was a high priest, which I think is is actually canon, <laughs> I guess you would say, yeah. um, and that he had taken this device and, and escaped with it, then built the Ark to, to recontain it to the same dimensions of what was in the pyramid. The pyramid also being perfect material for some sort of electrical uh, electrical insulator slash, forgetting the other word, but basically uh, the, the limestone being made of quartz microcrystals and uh the top of it being potentially limestone i think or granite sort of the same sort of electrical insulating properties and it's possible that uh when the arc was originally in there it was some sort of device that harnessed that that, that powered that powered something that's the sims um idea of what the arc was it's it's definitely a cool theory because it, it starts to bring up uh, ideas of what we could possibly do with this understanding um, in sort in terms of gravitational control, in terms of power generation. Have you heard of like the EM drive? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, before we uh, seg off to that, does that arc st- cool about yeah. the arc story? Yeah. 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 Well, and I, w- I was just gonna say uh, in response to that, the Bible was really sort of a, a quantum mechanical handbook. Really, I mean, it's it's understanding of quantum physics when you really dig into it is sort of astounding. Yeah, yeah, it's another one where, where looking back in the right lens, it's like, oh my god, this is not what we all thought it was, for sure. There, there's, <laughs> there's tons of people that have done work in, you know, taking the Hebrew, the, the Gematria values of, like, the story of Genesis and, and finding geometries similar to what Nassim is describing, too, by, by taking the numerical value of the words and, and uh, the numerical value of, of Yahweh adding up to 64 in prime numbers and all, uh, all sorts of stuff along those lines. So, yeah, I totally agree. It, it, it's it's quite crazy. Yeah, you mentioned the EM drive. I, I know you wanted to talk about that. So what was it about that that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, so this seems like it's actually the, the beginning of um, what would be gravitational drives. Uh, we Obviously, it gets dismissed immediately because – it doesn't work in our in our framework because in our framework the vacuum is immutable, which means you can't you can't really push off of it. You can't uh, change the vacuum. It's this um, like rigid, static, in place virtual particle. But in the Sims in the Sims model, it's this uh, flowing superfluid of electromagnetic oscillators at a ground state. And so it, the way the way you can think about the EM drive, it's this conical can, right? And you induce an electromagnetic field in it. And if you think of that electromagnetic field as simply uh, like a spin, electromagnetic spin of vacuum, and it, it's this conical shape causes uh, this to be like more dense in one side because you have a faster spin in one side than you do on the other side. 
and you are you are like inducing a pressure gradient in the vacuum basically you're you're spinning vacuum just like a, a boat propeller would uh, spin water and uh, make and just pr- propel the belt through just to do that density and pr- and pressure changes and so it's possible that the EM drive is is the very beginning of what you, you would be an anti gravity machine. There's just so much here that it continues to fascinate me to no end. And there's it really does like I think I, I said this earlier. It really does connect all things, and I think yeah. that's why that's why I like it so much. And what does the black sun or the black stone have to do with this? Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. I I'm not sure if I have an answer other than that then it could be the black hole inside the arc. Um, I'm yeah, not okay. sure if I have any more information than that, but I'd be down to talk about it or try. I only know of the black sun through some esoteric studies. There was a, uh, like a, I guess you may call it like a secret society of some sort that started, mm-hmm. I think, in Tibet. And then the Nazis had an interest in that group. The I know Nazi that... black sun does sound familiar to me too. The occult yeah. Nazism. Although I'm not too familiar with it either. I heard Nassim talk about the Black Stone, and he was, but I think he was talking about something in terms of like Mecca. Right, that Black Cube in Mecca, maybe? Yeah, 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 the, yeah. The Black Cube in Mecca had some sort of connection to this, and then he, he mentioned the Black Sun as well. I don't think he mentioned, you know, Nazi Germany. I don't think he mentioned Tibet, which is obviously would go back much further with the Black mm-hmm. Sun knowledge, but. That seems to be what we're talking about, you know. If if it was a black hole, if the Ark was holding this sort of treasure, I guess, that's right. what it's always been rumored to be, right? Some sort of treasure. Right. And other ancient esoteric schools and civilizations knew something about this, then the Black Sun Society, or whatever the hell they were called, that would seem to be, like, what they were talking about. Unless there's another sun, black sun, that I'm just not aware of. No, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me too. Um, it, 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 there, there does seem to be a lot of occult stuff that surrounds this. Uh, it, it's also the like the black cube worshiping of you get like Orthodox Jewish people doing the same thing, and it's like it's got some sort of Saturn connection, I, I think. But I'm not, I'm not, I've never been clear on exactly what, except that it was sort of Saturn, Saturn worship. But then you get. Um, the Nazis definitely doing esoteric research and, and trying to dig into this a- ancient occult technology or nature. I'm not sure what you would call it. They have got, you know, the Nazi bell stories with some sort of possible um, UFO, anti, anti-gravity anti drive, which also sort of relates back to, to this where there was, I think they were spinning mercury or, or something along those lines. That, that definitely could be encapsulated too or, or, or uh, branched off into too. Yeah, man, for sure. That's just, it's crazy. It's just, yeah, it's so crazy. Like, I think we're, we're sort of, uh, at a loss for words here. I, I think we're just like, I geek out on this stuff. I just like to hear people talk about it. So. Me too, man. Hey, that's uh, why I'm, I'm, I'm totally obsessed with it. You know, so I guess that's, that's why I started Hollow Fractal and everything. It just doesn't end. It doesn't end. It's finally a backdrop to where all this stuff you can actually entertain. Like, before I was, I had trouble entertaining the experiences that I, or like mashing the experiences that I've had with, reality you know it's like part of my brain was like no this this is impossible you know once you get this sort of framework it, it allows you to evaluate all of this stuff in a in a new logical light and i love that about it i echo your sentiment there i want to wrap up here on a couple points that i think relate back to all of this and the first one is a connection seemingly here between geometry holographic fractals and crop circles could you take us through what that possible connection might be yeah so the, the, there's specific geometries of the vacuum as we were talking about uh, tetrahedral geometries that turn into like dynamics of, of torus and toroidal flow and it does seem that some crop circles echo those sort of dynamics or sentiments again we have that 64 tetrahedron structure uh, there's crop circles that are that in 2D, if you took it and you uh, looked at it in 2D, not not the flower of life. So we have the tetrahedral skeleton, and then if you encapsulate those in spheres, you get the flower of life. But if you just protect, project this tetrahedral skeleton, there's there's crop circles that absolutely echo that, that sentiment. Um, there's crop circles that, that uh, are, are certain fractals, like Coke, I'm not sure how you spell it, K-O-C-H fractals, which are triangular fractals that uh, you can zoom into infinitely, and there's Fractals that uh, that echo sort of Nassim's geometry blended with those geometries, kind of hinting 
sort of put puts ideas like if you contemplate it sort of put puts ideas in your head about about thinking about the, the fractal nature of this geometry and the fractal nature of energy dynamics there's one crop circle that is my favorite crop circle and it look it's like a uh it's a fractal torus basically it just looks like a giant uh like spin of spheres and it's made up of smaller spheres that are that are, look like they're also doing this toroidal flow. And that's my favorite crop circle because it's showing the one of the most fundamental properties of the universe. And that is everything is part of a fractal vorticular flow. Uh, everything from from the largest things to the smallest things is just a different instantiation of spin of of ether. And uh, it, it's it's awesome how it it encapsulated that principle in such a in such a simple you would think simple picture. So yeah, yeah um, the sim also believes that some of these uh, may actually have been communicated not from humans using uh, boards that are stomping stomping crops down, but from sort of <laughs> other intelligence. Right. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the term squaring the circle and, and what, what that actually means here too. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah, so somebody's work I stumbled on, um, I think it's cropcirclesandmore.com. He basically finds that you can construct these crop circles using a straight edge and compass, which is basically uh, one of the main tenets of uh, sacred geometry. Basically, there's certain rules that you have to follow. You can't measure anything. Uh, you can't uh, just pick your pen up and, and draw something and pick your pen up and draw something in another place. You have to use the laws of geometry, which is like you can draw a triangle and then you can encapsulate that triangle with the circle. And you can do all of this with just a, a straight edge and compass. And using that method, he was able to reconstruct these crop circles and find that they squared the circle almost to 100%. It's impossible to square the circle 100% with a square and compass. Squaring, sorry, let me back up. Um, squaring the circle means you are drawing a square with the same um, perimeter as a circle. So they are equal to each other. And it, it's, it was proven to be like impossible to do. Uh, with a square and compass, of course you could do it if you measured it, but due to the transcendent nature of pi, you can't uh, do this with these rules of geometry geometrically. Um, however, this guy found that many of these crop circles do come very close to squaring the circle, and that brings up some some weird implications because first, not many people know about squaring the circle. You wouldn't it wouldn't really make sense for hoaxers to encode squaring the circle unless I mean. You know, unless they they knew about it and trying to trick people, but most people in the public don't know about it. So they're they're only tricking, they're only trying to trick you know the top one percent of the one percent of people that even look into crop circles. Uh, another aspect of it is that it's extremely hard to to pull it off. Like you can't just say, oh, I'm going to draw a triangle, then I'm going to encapsulate in a circle, then I'm going to draw a square, and uh, I'm going to you know do 15 more steps, and then I'm going to have a square that is the same perimeter as a circle. It doesn't really work like that you would need to have uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of iterations of doing this until you even get close and the fact that it's repeatedly encoded in crop circles is kind of um i, I look at it as, as like a calling card for like this was this was made with high intelligence and like pay attention to this like it, it, it didn't just appear through drunk guys stomping in a field <laughs> yeah and i'm always good for a sort of superficial low intelligence reference for these sorts of things but i'm a fan of pro wrestling fun mm -hmm. fact one of my other favorite subreddits is squared circle, squared which, circle is, right? <laughs> which is ironic because i've always been a fan of that sort of entertainment i guess and they call their ring the squared circle and just recently, I I sort of like had this revelation that like shit, like there may be some connection there between pro wrestling and you know these sort of like esoteric mystery schools. And I'm actually trying to write something about it. I don't know if I'm stretching here or like trying to connect too many dots. But no, no. when you get into like the history of drama, like Greek drama, and and what what these other sorts of cultures may have known, you know, and this these sorts of melodramas, and then their um knowledge of you know the things that we're sort of talking about as well i don't know if i'm i'm losing my train of thought in the middle of this no, that that makes sense like they, <laughs> that that, it, it, that the start of of wrestling could have had its roots in in that and where well, they knew about it in the in these societies and if it, if wrestling just started off of those then it's possible that it, it, it retained that somehow 
Well, yeah, and I think what I was trying to say was wrestling or combat, I guess, started in like a gladiatorial circle. Right. And then modern wrestling now, you know, which is which is obviously scripted and it is drama, takes right. place in, in a squared ring that they call the squared circle. And so I don't know what the pattern is that may connect all this, but I also have a thread here. I equate pro wrestling to it's sort of like a key that unlocks what you sort of see across media, just in terms of like go to politics, for example. I see politics as sort of like theater. I don't, I don't right. know if that, I think it's all very, it all seems very scripted. And That's super you, interesting. Well, <laughs> what we see now, Donald Trump is president, right? Well, he has a tie to pro wrestling. He has worked with <laughs> right. Vince McMahon in the WWE. So it, it's an interesting connection that I think needs to be explored. I'm going to try to be the one that explores it, connecting pro wrestling and geometry and scoring the circle and all this. And as you can see, my thoughts are very scattered about this right now because I'm really just starting to look into it. But uh, I think there's that, something there. Yeah, that, that seems super interesting. And like the more we um, uncover these sorts of things, the less that – Stuff like that seems to be coincidental, you know. Yeah. There, there's this square in the circle in the Vatican, like in the Vatican's garden. Like, oh yeah, yeah. It, 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 so it's like, it's this. I'm sure you've seen uh, like Secrets in Plain Sight documentary. It's nuts, man. It's like there's two levels of society: ones that have like known and hoarded this knowledge, and the rest of the people that watch the cir- bread and circuses, you know, it's, it's... Well, yeah, and that's why I kind of feel bad for talking about pro wrestling, because it's total circus, but you find those those secrets hidden in plain sight in the most unlikely of places, too. Like, I can turn on pro wrestling, and I can see really overt esoteric symbols on wrestlers' tights or pants or jackets or something like in the graphics for their shows like there's a lot of pyramid symbolism and and eye symbolism and they just introduce a new character called alistair black and he's totally just he's walking to the ring he's got this jacket on he's got all these symbols on it that relate to like crowley and like yeah so it's a very interesting time all these things sort of seem to be coming to the surface but uh, let's stop talking about pro wrestling. I'm, I'm getting a little little (laughs) too into that that right now (laughs) i do want to wrap up on one last thought here I saw you guys sort of cross-posting this. You Conspiracy hosted an AMA recently with Alan Green, who's the author of this really tremendous book, I guess. And, and there's a lot of videos called the, the Shakespeare Equation. And I don't want to get too far into this because I'm actually going to try to get Alan on my show here. But maybe a sort of a teaser. And because I know you're interested in it and because I know it also sort of connects to this whole thing that we've been talking about. What was Alan Green's theory here? And how does it, I guess, connect to... All of this holographic, esoteric stuff that we've been talking about. Yeah, so Alan Green's work, um, it kind of came out of nowhere, at least for me. I, I mean, all of a sudden, these um, these videos were on YouTube that were like ex- like earth-shattering, in my opinion. Um, they basically, he basically was using um, geometry, basic geometry, on the cover of Shakespeare's sonnets and... He was fine. He, he like there was there's a, there's a couple of lines and dots on the cover of this of this cover that that seem like out of place. They're just they seem like they're placed very weirdly. And uh, it turns out that if you you can connect them in the right way, like with right right angle triangles, that in no way can be a coincidence. That um, actually encode like mathematical constants, um, twelve mathematical constants, some of which were not supposed to be even discovered um at the time when this when the sonnets cover was made he also does um tons of research into these into this same type of work in the great pyramid and finds the same 12 constants encoded he he doesn't really hypothesize i haven't really seen him hypothesize too much about who actually who actually encoded it and why although i do think he has his own theories but it all ties back to again to this this occult knowledge that had to have come from a sort of a, like a, a advanced ancient like unified civilization, and the thing about his work is, it's almost proof of it. Or if it's not proof, it's enormous evidence that point to some sort of non-linear evolution of our knowledge of history. Yeah, and I might link to uh, his barcode videos in the show notes just for the people that may be interested. But 
Yeah, that, he would be an awesome guest, dude. That would be so cool if you got him. He's he's a really nice guy. I, I was talking to him email, so I'm sure he would be interested in it. Yeah, for sure. I actually heard him on a. Uh, have you heard of Grimerica? It sounds familiar, but I yeah, it's uh, it's a it's another podcast that's sort of in this realm as well. And they had him on actually uh, a couple months ago. Awesome. I'll check that yeah, out. So, no, yeah, that's that's where I actually heard his theories. And then all of a sudden, bam, he's all over Reddit. Just like people are talking about him. People are sharing his stuff. And now he has this 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 AMA recently. So, it's, yeah, it's a pretty interesting, exciting time for really the occult in general. I feel very fortunate that I'm getting into this right now because it seems that people are taking more of an interest in these sorts of subjects. And it also gets me to, you know, get on a call with guys like you who are so knowledgeable and really just trying to help people understand not only the the exoteric you know the the universe outside of us better but also the one within us the the esoteric so joe i really do appreciate your time do you have like any websites or social media or is it just want people to traffic your subreddit if they're interested in learning more yeah just come to the sub come um, contribute if, if you if you have anything but yeah definitely definitely the subreddit is the spot to hang out for now and uh yeah thank you for having me on this is this is really cool and i'm glad i'm glad that this sort of information is uh, that we can do this too like that 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 we're in an age where the, where this sort of information can can be spread like this yeah say what you will about the internet man but it is a powerful powerful tool when used correctly Yep, it might be our only way out of this mess. It definitely might be. So, Joe, D8 underscore THC on Reddit. Thank you for being here, man. No problem. Thanks for having me, Ryan. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Joe, a.k.a. D8 underscore THC on Reddit. Check out the Holofractal subreddit if you want to interact with their growing community. And check out Nassim Harriman's work as well. Both are linked in the show notes. I gotta admit that some of this is still over my head, but from what I can make of it, this theory does make a lot of sense. Uh, Although it's difficult to contextualize it without just repeating everything Joe just told us. This is one of those things where I just urge you to digest it at your own pace and see what sort of conclusions you may come to. But it definitely gives an entirely new spin to the phrase, let there be light. And as we did point out, if you want a non-physics explanation of it, read up on Indra's net. Or hey, if you want that literary explanation, pick up House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. I read that novel 15 or so years ago, and never knew until recently that it exhibited a fundamental grasp of this holographic quantum principle. It's also worth noting that Danielewski's second novel after House of Leaves was called Only Revolutions, so perhaps some more clues are embedded in there. And I suppose you could give the old Holy Bible a read or reread and see what you make of that text as it relates to this theory as well. But hey, I don't mean to cut this short, but it is Labor Day, and I've already labored far longer than I've wanted to, so I gotta get out of here. If you like what you heard, please do consider supporting the show by visiting oldculturepodcast.com slash support. There are three contribution options, a recurring monthly option through PayPal, a one-time donation through PayPal, and a one-time donation via Bitcoin. If you can't spare any change, I get it. Pop open iTunes, leave the show a five-star rating, which helps us out tremendously. Or hey, you know, send a link to a friend or something. The more people that hear us, the better this show's going to be. And until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. <laughs>
Cassette.